just one quick question for you, Elias. The um, so the at MD Anderson, you 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 don't use pediatric inspired regimens for ALL upfront at all, or uh, there is some cutoff age. You know, there, uh, as you know, there's a meta-analysis published by Wendy Stark which showed that pediatric regimen are superior as well as other people. So we conducted a pediatric regimen trial, prospective phase two study, augmented BFM, where we treated more than 100 patients. And then uh, we tried our best because we were reluctant to do it, but then we tried to accrue the study. We accrued the study and we had 100 patients. And then we compared to the hyper CVAD, another phase two prospective trial, and the outcome was exactly similar. So then we had a confirmation, our own confirmation, that hyper CVAD is as good as a pediatric regimen. So we adopted finally the hyper CVAD all along. Now, in the hyper CVAD, there is asparaginase in what we call the late intensification, two cycles, not as much as we do the pediatric regimen. But we're moving away from even the hyper CVAD to reduce it and add a blina ionotuzumab to the front line. And we strongly believe that these drugs are hard to combine them with, spec and with asparaginase because of liver dysfunction and toxicities. And therefore, we think hyper CVAD is a better dynamic backbone regimen where we can improve it and optimize it. I don't think right now it's time for randomized trial in ALL. There's so many new drugs and so many new concepts to test. So at Anderson, we adopted a basic dynamic uh, design regimen where we can enroll 20, 40 patients, look for efficacy and safety, and see how we can optimize them. Because if you're going to go for randomized trial with one regimen, by the time you get the results, things are moving and improving. So, so this is our strategy. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Burnett, so I'm confused. If you go to leukemia treating doctor, they say, MRD, they don't need transplant. If you go to the transplanter, they say, if the patient is MRD negative, the outcome of transplant is better. If you go to leukemia, they say, don't transplant good cytogenetic. If you go to transplanter, they say, best outcome of transplant in good cytogenetic. So tell me what to do, please. So the question, when you take your patient to transplant, at what time? Do you wait for MRD negativity, you know, with the salvage regimen? Or um, you just, once the patient in CR, you go ahead and transplant? Fortunately, I don't make these decisions anymore. But um, the data I showed there was observational data. People weren't reacting to the negativity or positivity. That was just data that was collected as they went along. Uh, which is quite helpful in terms of if they weren't persuaded by the MRD result what to do, then at least you know uh, the impact. Now, Roland Walters' AML, or acute leukemia stuff, where he shows a very good outcome for the patients who are MRD negative, 80% or something survival. Um, I think that's understandable, but it raises a question in my mind do these patients need a transplant in the first place? And that's really uh, in the context of carrying a 25% mortality, something I think's got to be thought about. Uh, so uh, the situation now in the UK, as I understand it, is that we've always been doubtful about transplanting patients we call standard risk. Um, that standard risk has been further divided by finding patients that are positive in certain situations. <clears throat> the MPL1 patients who are positive in the peripheral blood do very badly and they are now regarded as high risk. Small number of patients, about 10% of MPL1s. So um, we haven't uh, we haven't got data, but we should get data. Uh, which I think gets to your point. That is, patients who are MRD positive, who are pushed into high risk, will find out if we can get them negative and what happened to them when they transplanted. I think that's the issue, to find out whether you can make a positive patient better before they go to transplant is uh, a situation that we might be able to ask from the current trial that's ongoing. I have a question to you, Dr. Burnett. For the 3 ITD positive patients, 
Intermediate risk, you get the TKIs in combination with chemotherapy. They respond very well. They become MRD negative, no allele burden detected. Will you still consider them intermediate risk and you go for transplant? Or eventually we may maintain them on TKI plus something else without transplantation? I don't think we've got data on that yet because we've only, but the, the plan, as I understand what they're doing, is that they will go on TKI and, that, uh, and they won't necessarily go to transplant. I mean, the allelic ratio and all that sort of stuff cuts in, but. Question for you again, Dr. Uh, Yellow. So, the, if you have access to like one medication, Blina or Inotrizumab in the lab setting, which one, which one you will go with if you're planning for transplant? Okay, well, a diplomatic way to answer, we're using them both. Uh, no, to be honest with you, if I have somebody with high tumor burden up front, Blina will not be my best choice because of cytokine syndrome. I have to start to reduce them first and then go to Blina subsequently. In contrast, if I have somebody who had a transplant done, reduction right after transplant, and they go for a second transplant, I know will not be my best choice. In any case, I will not use either drug alone. I will always combine them with some low-dose chemotherapy to further optimize the efficacy. What kind of chemo you use to reduce burden? You know, there's no data in a protocol where you use blenotinumab, they recommended sacrofosamide and steroid. At NDC, we're using what we call the mini-hyper-CVD, which is sacrofosamide, 150 milligram per square per dose. No intracyclines, vincristine, and, uh, sacro and decadron, 20 milligram per day for four days. And then give blena on day five. That's all. There is a new concept beyond MRD, and one abstract presented in ASH is this uh, tumor circulating DNA. Tumor circulating DNA. So which is a very, very sensitive way of picking up the disease resist uh, persistence after the transplant. So every now and then there is a new thing coming. It's evolving, uh, dynamic, never stop. Well, you know, we've got no information on that. I know that some of the solid tumor guys are into that now, and I just wonder how much it really does tell them because, you know, they've struggled to get anything sensitive. But I don't know what you think. I mean, someone's got to look at it. And uh, post-transplant, would you give a brain as a maintenance uh, for your location? Will you follow MRD? There's ongoing trial assessing brain and post-transplantation. There's no data yet. Back to one, one more additional point. We do have these good cytogenetic Saudi patients, and they are not good cytogenetic. They are good people, but not good cytogenetics. So I think there is something different between the Western and Middle East leukemia. And at one time, they had this Middle East leukemia, they do bad. And it has to do with not pharmacodynamic, not pharmacokinetic but pharmacogenomics, the way our population react to the chemotherapy, we don't know. But seriously, we do have uh, good cytogenetic, even CK negative, and they do relapse, even after transplant, they do relapse. 821 King Faisal Riyadh, they have different story, and they have different protocol. You didn't show this here, one. Tell them what you do in Riyadh. No, but what's your practice? Do you... Okay, so that's what... Um, it's, I mean, Hydro's RSE is very important in that disease. I don't know whether you've got that incorporated. Uh, and uh, the flag Ida up front in the younger patients you know, either GO will do the job for us or Flag Ida will do the job for us, but the consolidation RSC is also important for us. I noticed that you're, and you're not alone in that actually. Uh, I wouldn't like to give the impression that our patients don't relapse. They do relapse, but we've been able to get them back. Nothing to do with MRD, spotting MRD. Uh, we've just been able, just been fortunate to get these patients uh, back. And uh, when we looked at that data curability, if you get transplant up, fr uh, up front, uh, doing a transplant on the CBFs who got into second remission, it was a pretty marginal benefit, actually. So maybe we do have different uh, stuff going on. 
I couldn't tell you that offhand. If they relapse, they seem to relapse fairly quickly. Positive. Uh, the good factors, uh, CBF leukemias, give them flag either GO and they are MRD positive at 0.1%. What's your strategy for these patients? We don't change treatment. No. No. We, yes. I don't know if that's a formal strategy, but that's what's done. Any other questions? Could I ask, could I ask you yeah. about hyper-CVAD? What's the oldest age that you'd be comfortable giving hyper-CVAD to? Because we found it a bit heavy duty in patients in the fifth decade. Uh, after 55 and 60, we do not use hyper-CVAD no. at all. 60 and older, at the beginning, we used to adjust to go to hyper-CVAD, mainly reducing intracycline by 50% and the rest as well by a third. But now with the new drugs, we don't give it anymore at all. I have a question for you. Can I have one question? So we have approval in the U.S. for HMA plus venetoclax for frontline for unfit. We have HMA and glastigib as well for frontline unfit. And then eventually we can get IDH1 plus HMA, and we can get free 3 inhibitors on HMA. So what, is, should be, what should be the minimal backbone to test the new drugs? We moved away from HMA alone to HMA and Ven plus adding triplet, a drug to make a triplet, or...? Um, yes. Yes, I mean, you probably, uh, I think to be practical in the U.S., it has to be a demethylating agent because even although you guys and we try with low dose RSE, it's logistically difficult to give the twice a day schedule in the States. You get away with it in Britain because it's inexpensive. Uh, and we don't, we didn't get the demethylators approved. In, in, but, you know, there are almost limitless possibilities of what you could go with. Uh, triple. I mean, the venetoclax addition is so easy to give, as I understand it, that you could probably easily run in another drug. So it's probably a case for a pick-a-winner, multi-stage, randomized trial. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think we'll conclude our symposium. Thank you, everyone, for the attendance. Thank you, professors. Yeah.